This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Singapore's War on COVID, a podcast series by The Straits Times. This podcast series is based on selected chapters from a book detailing Singapore's experience battling the COVID-19 pandemic. The book, written by journalists of The Straits Times and edited by ST's executive editor Sumiko Tan, is titled In This Together, Singapore's COVID-19 Story and is available in major bookstores now. Details online at stbooks.sg Hello, I'm Sumiko Tan, Executive Editor of The Straits Times, and I'll be reading you an edited version of a chapter that I wrote for the book. Episode 3, Inside Singapore's COVID-19 War Room This is a story of Singapore's first two years managing the COVID-19 pandemic. From the start, the government decided that it would be as transparent as it could and that data and science would guide its response. But because so little was known about the virus, decisions had to be made in the fog of war. By the middle of January 2020, the new virus that was first reported in Wuhan, China, was rapidly spreading throughout Asia. Mr. Gan Kim Yong, Singapore's Minister for Health, knew this was going to be a crisis beyond his ministry. He decided to set up a multi-ministry task force to manage the government's response. It would be co-chaired by Mr. Lawrence Wong, who was then the National Development Minister. As Mr. Gan explained, uh, When I first uh, look at the uh, outbreak, I needed to make sure that uh, we have sufficient resources so that we can marshal the uh, support of the whole of government. And it requires actually more than one uh, chairman's work because it's so complex. On January 22nd, the government announced the formation of the 10-member multi-ministry task force. The ministers included the majority of Singapore's fourth-generation leadership. Observers pointed out how this would be a major test of their ability to handle a national crisis. The task force came to be known among Singaporeans as the MTF for short. On January 23rd, just one day after the MTF was formed, a 66-year-old man from Wuhan on holiday with his family became Singapore's case number one. The crisis that was to engulf the world had touched down in Singapore. The MTF held its meetings at the Ministry of Home Affairs in Irrawaddy Road. The ministry is housed in a pair of grey towers known as New Phoenix Park. Meetings were held at the Phoenix Boardroom on the 20th floor. This is a large and gloomy space adorned with gleaming black pillars and a capacious brown conference table occupying practically the whole room. This became Singapore's COVID-19 war room. Working in parallel with the MTF was the Homefront Crisis Executive Group. This is a high-powered group of civil servants which springs into action during times of national crisis. It was convened on January 22nd, the same day as the MTF. The group is always chaired by the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Home Affairs, in this case, Mr. Pang Kin Kyung. Explaining the work of the group, Mr. Pang said it has two primary functions. The one is get the information, make the analysis, make our recommendations where policy issues are concerned. And then we'll go up to MTF. MTF does, must bring in their own perspectives, their own judgment, uh, their own political lens uh, to it, uh, and decide whether they accept our recommendations or ask us to tweak it or take a different decision. Um, so that's one key role. The second role is um, we um, operationalize actually all the policies the MTF decides. Uh, the HCG's role is to ensure 
um, effective and proper uh, implementation and operationalization on the ground. The MTF decided that it would be transparent about how it dealt with COVID-19, as Mr. Gan explained. We decided from uh, uh, the beginning between Lawrence and I and the whole MTF that uh, the key is really to be transparent as much as we could, other than patient sensitivity and commercial uh, concerns or uh, bilateral issues, we then are more careful. Beyond that, whatever we know is whatever you know, whatever we tell you is whatever we know. So uh, we just went in, uh, be prepared to be frank and upfront but, uh, un- to answer the questions. If we don't know, we say we don't know, we'll go and find out. The day-to-day management of the pandemic was handled by the MTF. But Prime Minister Lee Sien Loong stepped in at significant moments to address the nation and calm nerves. In 2020, the first year of COVID-19, he gave seven speeches. In 2021, when the situation had stabilised, he gave two. Mr S. Iswaran, who was Minister for Communications and Information in the first year of the pandemic, said... So, our objective has always been that when PM comes, it's at key points, because it's he's there to present the strategic picture, the big issues, and and the large message points have to be complete. Then the MTF has, gives you the more regular cadence because there's a certain tempo to what we are doing and a lot of it is operational in nature, but operational in a manner that impacts all of us. So you need that regular cadence. To respond swiftly and decisively to the virus, a clear chain of command in government was necessary. The Home Front Executive Group of Civil Servants reports to the MTF and the MTF reports to the Cabinet, which also decides on major policies such as border closures. In April 2020, Senior Minister Teo Chi Hien was asked by the Prime Minister to oversee a big outbreak at migrant worker dormitories. While he spoke to officers from the different ministries to get a feel of how they were getting on, he didn't give orders. He saw his role as helping to create a structure. Senior Minister Teo said, Whenever they needed to decide on what to do, it has to go through the proper chain of command. But in the end, the MTF decides. And that has to be the way. You have to have a unity of command. Mr Wong said the MTF was guided by its advisor, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet and Senior Minister Teo. But day to day, the MTF made the call. He said, We operated um, you know, without having to clear every single decision. Otherwise, that would have been very slow and we would not have been able to respond and operate at the speed at which we did. Prime Minister Lee said, I depend a lot on the ministers because I think they are hands-on, they are meeting their officials daily, they are dealing with the situation, they have their ministries under their charge and they have to deal with the operational consequences of strategic decisions. So if I give operational instructions and cross lines with them, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to work. Besides being transparent and having a clear chain of command internally, Another facet of the Singapore response was how decisions were guided by data. Prime Minister Lee said, You have to be data-based. You have to know what is actually happening, what is working, what is not working, what the trends are, how to interpret them, and therefore what do, how do I react to them. Whether it's trends of infections, trends of people going to ICU, trends of uh, uh, people coming in from overseas, and therefore, from coming in to being positive, from being positive to having to go to hospital, from being in hospital to maybe coming out and possibly along the way um, infecting others, what, what are the data? Then I can make informed decisions. So as PM, I need to make sure that we have the information, that we are asking the right questions, and that we are shifting gears at the right time. Unlike past economic and security crises, the pandemic required the whole of government to be mobilised on a sustained basis. 
it also had to operate in a way which it was not structured to do. Prime Minister Lee said, And you've had to build on the fly and organize, and you're running a war. So it's not a small operation where you can be in charge of everything and you can tell everybody, you do this, 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 and do exactly as I tell you and everything will be fine. I've got to work through the ministers more. I've got to depend on giving the right overall guidance and then depend on them to interpret that guidance in their day-to-day decisions. And at the same time, I've got to have a feel, dipstick of what's happening as a result of all this machinery and process so that if it's not quite happening right, you have the right feel and you can calibrate and shift course. And that's a different way to operate. He told the ministers that the daily report given to the cabinet about the COVID situation should also be made public. During the dormitory outbreak, he also got daily updates, down to information including how many workers were being transported from hospital back to the dorms. Prime Minister Lee said it wasn't just about numbers. So we're getting patients come in who are imported, right? And we see them a half a dozen a day, a dozen a day. So what are their profiles like? Are these people who are very sick? Are these people who are old cases? Are these people who, are, uh, who go on to show symptoms? Because most of them, when we catch them, are still without symptoms. And then if they show symptoms, well, how long do we have to keep them in hospital? And you need to have this kind of feel, then you know how big a problem I have. And if I have a big problem, I have to tighten up on the inflows of arrivals. If, in fact, most of them are not so sick, and I have space for them, then I can consider easing out on arrivals and allowing more flows. So is that kind of feel which you need? Being able to analyse the data in such a way was a luxury that came only later, he acknowledged. At the start of the dormitory spike, the government had to just bludgeon its way to implement the big moves and deal with the situation at hand. He explained... It's what uh, at Teo Chi Hien calls a First World War type battle. You are not going for fine tuning, you are not going for precise numbers. You just want to have a barrage, uh, a, a major operation to just stamp, stamp it down, do big right things, never mind the small optimizations. When that's under control, then we can think about tuning it, get, making sure that we are not paying more of an opportunity cost and we should, making sure that we are, we are doing things as well as we can. With so many decisions to be made, were there heated arguments in Cabinet? I don't think anybody in Cabinet doubts the validity of the opposing point of view. We knew that these were contending considerations, but each one, each minister has his the perspective which he has to put forward so that overall cabinet has to make the right decision and the right balance. And you have to have that balance. He gave the example of how the Ministry of Health is responsible not just for treating sick people, but also for public health, which is not quite the same thing. You want to treat every person as well as possible, but if you are dealing with a population of a few hundred thousand or a few million, and I want to make sure that the population stays well, I need to look at it from a, in a different way. It's public health. Then, then I may decide whom to give priority to, whom I want to uh, allocate my ICU or my hospital beds to, and so on. So that's MOH's perspective. But both public health and clinical treatment are MOH. But if, it, if you're talking about eco- the economy, if you're talking about security, if you're talking about our international standing, that's not MOH's responsibility in Cabinet, I mean, we all take collective responsibility for the decisions. To cushion the economic blow, the Ministry of Finance came up with an unprecedented five budgets and a slew of support measures. Every decision had a trade-off, and one of the key ones taken was border control. The decision in early 2020 to close Changi Airport was especially painful. 
for us to shift gears from business as usual to progressively locking down was a very tough decision because we make our living based on Changi and being a hub. And if you decide to lock down Changi and make it difficult for flights to come through and for passengers to come through, and you move when other airports in the region uh, have not done so, then whatever the long-term benefits, the immediate consequence will be the flights will go to the other hubs and Changi will be down and out. And that's not a decision which you can make very lightly. Going into lockdown in April 2020 was another major decision. He recounted the thinking behind what Singapore called its circuit breaker. We had held it off as long as we could because we knew that once you're locked down, uh, the clock is ticking. I mean, you're holding your breath and after a while you do have to let go and breathe again and you know, activities have to start up again. So we did not want to do it until we absolutely had to do it. And that was at the end of March, I remember it came to... We discussed it in Cabinet and uh, MTF had different views uh, whether we should move or whether we should wait a little bit longer. My feeling was that we should move because the trends were clear. It's not a matter of the threshold, you know, whether you're at 10 or at 20 or at 30 or 50 or 100. But what the trend is and does it, is it something stable and apparently and under control? Or is it something which is growing day by day and it hasn't gotten out of hand yet, but it's heading in that direction? So my view, looking at the numbers and just eyeballing it, was that it was heading in a bad direction and we should move. There was no point waiting. But it was a very big decision, so I told the ministers, you, we sleep on this, we meet again tomorrow. You have a proposal. I think you come with this proposal tomorrow, but you give me another proposal which is 30% steeper than that. Because by then the situation may have moved and your mindset may have moved. And if I'm going to act, I'd rather overreact rather than underreact. And let's think about it tomorrow, we decide. So we cabinet was on Wednesday. We met again on Thursday. We made the decision to go for a circuit breaker. That was a very major decision, very expensive decision because the hit on the economy was considerable and it meant we needed further budget packages and large draws on our reserves. But I think it was necessary and just in time because after we moved for about 10 days, the cases kept on going up and the cases in the dorms also started to go up. On December 21st, 2020, Singapore received its first shipment of vaccines. For the first five months of 2021, infections were indeed kept under control. There were days without any new cases reported in the community. But in mid-2021, the Delta variant rewrote Playbook. Delta was not only more infectious compared with the earlier variants, but could also cause more severe sickness, especially among the unvaccinated, the elderly and those with existing health problems. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, 29 people died of COVID in Singapore. By December 1st, 2021, the number had climbed to 726. To fight Delta, the MTF had to constantly tweak rules such as eating in restaurants, sizes of social gatherings, home recovery protocols, and even down to details such as the playing of wind instruments. The country moved in and out of a series of phases and stages. In October 2021, the Prime Minister spoke to a weary nation to explain why Singapore was moving from zero COVID to living with COVID. 
zero COVID was the right strategy at that time. Our population was not yet vaccinated. People had little or no immunity against COVID-19. The consequences of catching the virus were serious. But because the virus was not so infectious then, our measures could work to break the chain of transmission. The strategy succeeded. We avoided the huge loss of lives that many countries saw. We have one of the lowest COVID death rates in the world. Singapore also planned ahead and secured vaccine supplies early, he said. Despite high vaccination rates, the virus could not be stamped out through lockdowns or safe distancing measures. This was a reality many countries had already accepted. Even if we've been vaccinated, we are still at some risk of getting infected. This is why we must be prepared to see quite many COVID cases for some time to come. Yet, Singapore cannot stay locked down and closed off indefinitely. It would not work and it would be very costly. We'd be unable to resume our lives, participate in social activities, open our borders and revive our economy. Each time we tighten up, businesses are further disrupted. Workers lose jobs. Children are deprived of a proper childhood and school life. Families are separated for even longer, especially families with loved ones overseas and extended families who've not been able to come together. All these cause psychological and emotional strain and mental fatigue for Singaporeans and for everyone else here with us, including our migrant workers. Therefore, we concluded a few months ago that a zero COVID strategy was no longer feasible. So we changed strategy to living with COVID-19. By around November 2021, the number of Delta cases began to stabilise. Singaporeans breathed a small sigh of relief, but not for long. As the world headed to 2022, a third year of the pandemic, another variant emerged, Omicron. New challenges were in store for Singapore's fight against COVID, as the Prime Minister put it. It's a war rather than a battle. Thanks for listening. I'm Sumiko Tan for The Straits Times. In the next episode on May 9th, I'll chronicle the lessons Singapore learned from its war on COVID-19, including why it had to make a U-turn on the wearing of face masks. You've been listening to Singapore's War on COVID, a podcast series by The Straits Times. This podcast series is based on selected chapters from a book detailing Singapore's experience battling the COVID-19 pandemic. The book, written by journalists of The Straits Times and edited by ST's executive editor Sumiko Tan, is titled In This Together, Singapore's COVID-19 Story and is available in major bookstores now. Details online at stbooks.sg that was a podcast by The Straits Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times, and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.